Today we continue in the study of the book of Acts and we look today at chapter 12. And before we read these 25 verses of chapter 12, we want to go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Father, thank you for your provision and your care and your protection of our lives. Thank you that we do not have the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. But Lord, we know that many things about this earth are much too difficult for us. We can't handle life. We can't figure it out. We can't control it in our own plans, in our own strength. And so, Father, today we come to this chapter and know that it is for our good and our reassurance and for our poverty that we see the devil attack the church of Christ. And he may attack us in the days ahead. And if he does, Lord, we pray that you would keep us close to you and protect us. That you would not let that hinder your will in our life. But Lord, you would teach us the things that, that we need to know from it. Because we know that you control all circumstances. And even Satan's movements is restricted by your power so that he cannot do everything that he would. And that you let trouble come into our life for a reason. And so, Lord, today we pray that we may profit and learn and be ready. And though we do not seek trouble, we should not fear to live because of it. Thank you for your grace and your mercy and your strength. And we know that the thing that we need done and the work that we need to do is done by your Son. And it is to His honor and glory, and it is to His in His name we pray. Amen. If the devil could, he would crush every one of us this very moment. He's able to if God just takes his hand off of us and allows it. And look at the life of Job. And God knew what Job would do and he knew that Job would trust in him. And he knew that Job was a sinful human being but he knew that Job in the end would learn from all his trials and his troubles and so God permitted. But the devil cannot do anything he wants. If he could do anything he wants to us, he would crush us all this very instant. He would not wait. He would not tarry and play with us as a cat with a mouse. He would end our usefulness and our existence if he could. But he can't. Because God is in control. God is the sovereign of this universe. God is still working in His power and His righteousness and His goodness and His holiness and His word and His plan for this world has not changed. God is on the throne working His will. And we are safe in Him. Sometimes when things happen, and especially if we view them in our own wisdom, in our own strength, especially when we are younger in the faith, and we just wish that somebody knew how we felt, somebody knew our fear and our terror, somebody knew the pain and the hurt and the anguish and the concern that was present in our heart. But I tell you that God does know. 
and the knowledge that God knows the trouble that we're in. He knows the attack of the enemy. He knows how we've been misrepresented, even maybe in the church where we were. He knows how people have lied about us and how they, they have uh, tried to hurt us and how they talk about us and, 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 and abuse us. God knows about things like that. And the knowledge that He knows makes all the difference in the world. And the thing that we must do, and the thing that we must consider is this, that we must not let the attack of the enemy keep us from doing that which is right and which is God's will. We must not yield to that. We cannot hold back his attack. We cannot undo the wrong. We cannot overcome the attack. We cannot provide peace in the attack. But we can yield and trust and depend on the God that we know that can and will if we will trust Him. And we must not be deterred. And what the attack is all about is that we quit doing God's will or that we be hindered by doing God, in, in doing God's will or we be misrepresented uh, in the opinions of men as we do God's will. But the results of life and living, the results of all that we do, we must leave to the hands of our God. We cannot produce fruit Oh, can we keep it and maintain it? And if we are in God's will and we are living in the truth of His Word depending on Him, we can just rest there and trust our God to take care of the attack of the enemy. We see the attack of the enemy and we look at it today uh, and we want to see it and then we want to look at it and find the lessons that we need to learn. Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church and he killed James the brother of John with a sword and he saw that it pleased the Jews he proceeded uh, further to take Peter also and they were the days of the unleavened bread and when he had apprehended him he put him in prison and delivered him to four quadrants of soldiers to keep him intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing by the church of God for him. When Herod would have brought him forth that same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. <clears throat> Behold, an angel of the Lord came unto him, and a light shone in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side, and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind thy sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Cast thy garment about thee, and, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and knew not that it was true that which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. And when they passed by the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate that leadeth to the city, and that openeth, uh, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and passed through one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent an angel and delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from the, all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a maid came to hearken, named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate, and they said unto her, Thou, thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was so. And then they said, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he, beckoning with his hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of prison, and said, Go show these things unto James. 
and unto the brethren, and he departed and went into another place. And as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers concerning what had become of Peter. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death and went down from Judea to Caesarea and abode there. And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon, but they came to him of one accord, and having made Blastus the king's chamberlain their friend, <clears throat> they desired peace, because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a set day, Herod, a royal in royal apparel, sat on his throne and made an oration to them, and the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a god and not a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten with worms and died. But the word of God grew and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem. And when they had fulfilled their ministry, they took with them John, whose surname was Mark. We see the attack of the enemy. The devil saw all his efforts come to no avail. The gospel was spreading everywhere. People were getting saved. They were understanding God's plan and His truth. There was power and peace and praise to the Lord Jesus everywhere. And the devil said, I've got to do something. And so he did. And in verses... <clears throat> 1 through 4, and then 18 through 25, we see the persecutor. Now, many times the devil uses human beings, and he used one here. He used an old acquaintance. He used Herod. And if you think about Herod's life, you think about all the chances he had to hear of the grace of God and repent and believe. John the Baptist had come and rebuked his evil lifestyle and he's married his wife's brother and having her unlawfully. And Herod, who was a selfish, wicked, boastful, egotistical man of power, had put John the Baptist in prison. And then later, though, he, he didn't really want to. He, he had his head chopped off because he had promised with an oath to give... Uh, the one that danced before him what she wore. And Herod had seen Jesus and heard him at his trial. And Herod had heard the gospel and the truth. And Herod here, in order to please the Jews and in order to fulfill the plan of Satan, reached out and killed the brother of John, James. Now the James later in the chapter is the brother of our Lord who who was one of the leaders after uh, the resurrection and believed, became one of the leaders at the church at Jerusalem. But it was James the disciple that was killed here. And because it seemed to please the Jews and it accomplished uh, Herod's evil purposes in his mindset, he said, I'm going to get Peter too. And so he arrested him and put him in prison. He was an awful man. He was an evil man. He was a man uh, whose forefather, uh, or at least the, his descendants, had been involved in killing the, the babies. It may have been this Herod. I, I'm not re really sure. I ought to look. But he had been involved in killing the babies at the birth of Christ. So he was an evil, wicked, desperate man, controlled by Satan. And so we see the persecutor here, Herod. And you say, why doesn't God do something if he's in control? And he is. Where is God in this? James is dead and Peter's in prison. Where's God? God's where he always is. God's doing what he knows is best for his own purposes, for his own glory, for his own will and the working of it. And we see in 18 through 25, God took care of Herod when God's purposes and his time that he had set for Herod was through. 
when he had given him every chance to hear and see the gospel and believe when his evil purposes had been done and God's plan was finished and God gave him this one more chance as it were and he wasn't getting along with Tyre and Sidon and, and they wanted to make peace with him and and uh, for their own benefit and so he got up and spoke and they uh, they probably flattered him a little but anyway they, they said this thing this is not a man Herod is a god and, and Herod said yeah that's right and swelled up in pride and God stroked, smote him dead with an awful disease and he was eaten with worms a terrible five or six day of violent pain and he died in anguish and pain God took care of him when his time was right God allowed him opportunity to hear and witness and saw his evil deeds and saw his resisting of truth and saw his selfishness and his pride and God let that be uh, for reasons that maybe only he would know but he let that be and worked that in his plan. And when the time was right, Herod was judged. And so will every other evil man be. And so will Satan himself be. And that's the thing that terrorizes his heart and his mind every moment of his existence. He knows God will and can. And someday may. The persecutor. He's in God's control. God knows what He's doing. God doesn't cause Him to do it. God isn't the author of evil, but God permits evil for His own purposes and His own plan. And then we see the prison. Listen, prison is never a good place to be. Prison is a place where we're restricted, where we cannot live our lives in the freedom that we want to do God's will, we think, or to do other things that we want and wish. Prison is torment. Prison is dirty. Prison is ugly. Prison is pain. Prison is unpleasant. Prison may be torture too. And so we find Peter in prison. What a different fellow Peter is. Look at him before the fire, fidgeting and, and nervous as, as the maid says to him, aren't you one of his followers? See him curse and swear, though he promised the Lord just a few hours before he would die with him. See him curse and swear that he never knew his Lord. Peter, uneasy, uncomfortable, unprepared, unready for the challenge of what? And now look at him in prison. Tomorrow's execution day, Peter thinks. What is he doing? Is he worrying? Is his eyelids wide open? Is he, is he praying even and saying, Oh Lord, spare me another day? No, Peter's asleep. He could not stay awake in the garden. It's amazing that he can sleep here. What has happened to Peter? Peter has learned to trust his Lord. Peter has learned to believe in the providence of his Lord. Peter has learned to know the power of his Lord. He does not know what tomorrow will hold. He doesn't have to know what's coming tomorrow. Either way, like the Hebrew children, he says, it may be that God will let us burn, but either way, we're not going to bow. We're going to do God's will. We know that our God is right and true. And Peter's in prison, asleep, not worried about execution day tomorrow. And listen, a prison couldn't prevent God's will in Peter's life. When the time comes for prisons to be emptied and God to give deliverance, he can unlock the doors and break the chain and put the guards asleep and you can walk right out free if that's what God wants. 
And that's what he wanted with Peter. It wasn't Peter's time to die. He had more work for him to do. He had more things he had for him to do. And so Peter confounded the enemy and gave praise to the people of God because of his deliverance. John Bunyan was a preacher of the gospel who preached in England and aroused the attack of the enemy and he was thrown into prison. And we say, what a waste, what a disappointment, what a shame. This preacher not free to preach. But wait a minute. God is at work here. And so in prison he wrote several marvelous books, one of which is Pilgrim's Progress, in which he reached more people for good than he could ever have reached with his physical presence and preaching in England during his life. Now later he was set free. But during that time he wrote marvelous books that have influenced the world for hundreds and hundreds of years. Marvelous testimonies to the work and will of God. And God used his prison to do his work. And take Apostle Paul. Paul who's preaching and and leaving in the mission work. And the devil says, wait a minute, we've got to stop this guy. And so we'll kill him. And when they could not kill him, he was put in prison. But is this a bad thing? Well, one might say it was a tragedy. But Paul wrote most of the New Testament from a cell in prison. You do not know what God's purposes are in the attack of the enemy. But do not fear the prison. It cannot hold one whom God would deliver. And then we see the prayer. The prayer of the saints. And I tell you that there are some responsibilities that we have in the Christian life. There are some things that we can do and God expects us to do them. And if we don't do them, God's not going to do them for us. There are responsibilities to the Christian life. But there are a lot of things in life that we absolutely cannot do. And for that, God gives us the person of His Son to do them for us. And the person of the Holy Spirit to do them for us. And one of the things that the Holy Spirit does for us he, even when we can't form the, the pain into words, He puts those thoughts and those longings and those groaning into words and makes some prayers to the Heavenly Father. He helps us when we pray. And I tell you that the natural response of a child of God in trouble when he cannot and does not know God's purpose and does not know what to do tomorrow. He just knows he cannot handle tomorrow and he cannot fulfill the responsibilities and need of tomorrow. Prayer is the natural response of the child of God and should be under all occasions. We should pray. And they were praying here. It is marvelous that they were praying. And in some measure, God delivered Peter as a result of their prayers. He put that desire and prompted it in their heart and they prayed. The, we, they didn't believe that their prayers would answer because Peter came knocked on the door. They wouldn't believe it was him. They were astonished. How could he get out of jail? They prayed, but they needed more faith in their prayers. And we always need more faith in our prayers. But they prayed and God used this marvelous gift to the church. And he delivered Peter and he gave them great joy and taught them great lessons. This thing of prayer. It is the response of faith. It is the response of God's will. It is the response of God working in us to do and accomplish His good pleasure. What we need, what we want, what we desire, what we do not understand, what we face, the burden that we have to bear, the attack of the enemy that we cannot turn aside or escape. We must deal with matters 
and especially the enemy, we must deal with it with prayer. The devil fears us most when we are on our knees in prayer. And how much do we pray? And how much will we pray? And how much do we believe God when we do pray? Prayer. We see the attack of the enemy, the persecutor, an evil, wicked, vile man that God took care of in his time and in his will. Satan used him, but God stopped him. And God defeated his attack. And God used his evil for his purposes to strengthen and teach and spread the gospel through the persecution and to teach his children to pray. God used it. And the prison cannot hold, cannot stop, cannot contain, cannot defeat God's will. And your prison may someday be an actual one or it may be a circumstance. It may be an event. It may be a pain in your life. It may be a hindrance in your life. It may be a misrepresentation by Satan of your life. It may be your struggle to do God's will and the resistance of everything and circumstances around you. But I tell you, there is no present that can hold one whom the Lord will deliver. And just as Bunyan learned when he was in the Doubting Castle and the giant of despair was beating his life every day so that he had no strength or hope or no purpose or no fruitfulness. He could not look up and see the goodness of God or the light of the day. And Bunyan writes about that and all of a sudden he leaps with joy and says, I have a key. It's here in my bosom. A key to unlock the door to Doubting Castle. And that key is prayer. And oh, that the church of God, all oh, that today in the view of the world and the attack of the enemy and the days in which we live. Oh, that we would pray. Look at Acts 12. Learn from the attack of the enemy and know the greatness and the goodness of the God that protects you and me, I pray. Amen.